Okay, everyone, welcome to another episode of O365A. Uh, today's episode, we're going to be uh, talking about uh, Polycom. And uh, we have uh, Adam Jacobs here today uh, to discuss with us the Polycom solution for uh, cloud video interoperability. So, uh, Adam, maybe if you can uh, tell us about yourself and uh, about your solution. Sure. Yeah, so I'm Adam Jacobs. I'm a principal Microsoft architect at, at, uh, at Polycom. So I work across a number of our, our Microsoft solutions and devices, um, but I'm very passionate about video interop and I've been working with Microsoft on video interop for in the region of about six years now. Um, so um, initially, um, our solution was built for um, Skype for Business Online. Um, and then after that was launched, we started working with Microsoft on the Teams uh, version of that, that product. Um, and obviously, with the Teams version of that product, it was geared towards being a little bit more generic, um, focused towards more partners than just Polycom. Um, but a lot of the great things that we built um, or co-developed with Microsoft with um, Cloud Video Interop uh, initially were then, was then brought forward to, uh, to Teams. Awesome. So um, I guess from a, from a Polycom perspective, like, wh what, is, what is the business focus um, for the product, right? Um, well, it, we, we've been doing um, Microsoft um, video interoperability uh, or just video interoperability in general for, you know, a long, long time now. Um, and um, I, I recall way back when one of the things that, um, you know, when I joined Polycom, one of the things I became aware of is that the way in which we do video interop, um, specific different ecosystems had to change somewhat. I remember when, when Link 2013 was released, um, you know, it was b because the video experience was improved so much at that point when Microsoft added, you know, SVC um, and multi-party video, um, just telling people to join uh, a, a virtual meeting room, um, whether they were, you know, Link or, or Cisco or Polycom or whatever, didn't cut it anymore. So um, one of the one of the first things that that I worked on was how can we make a scheduled experience, and, and instead of having everyone join a VMR, we could have people that were using Microsoft joining the Microsoft uh, MCU or AVMCU, and then people that were using VTCs could then dial in, you know, using um, you know the regular dial strings that they use, and we could bring those two worlds together. So I guess you know, going back to your question, it it really was. Um, from a business perspective, it was giving customers what they wanted and, and evolving to that that uh, requirement. Um, and that was one of the things we did to try and move with the times there. Awesome. So it wasn't really just more of the ad hoc join. It was like the whole meeting experience from start to finish scheduling perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that scheduling um, of a Skype meeting and enabling video interop um, we called that Real Connect, and that was we were one of the first vendors to come up with that concept. And, and through the success of it, um, we saw other vendors essentially replicating their own version of it. Um, and at that time, there was Akano, and then there was Pexit doing it. And you know, it just over time, it became the thing for you know the way to do video interop with uh, with Microsoft. Awesome, that's cool. Adam, maybe um, talk about uh, the most common devices that you're seeing um, organizations using your products use. Like, what are the what are the most common endpoints that you're seeing out there? Yeah, so that that's also something that we're seeing is evolving. Um, originally, it used to be mainly Cisco endpoints, um, and we because you know we're running this cloud service, we can actually see all the agent strings that are joining the service and, and we can see the breakdown of agent strings that are dialing in and, and the versions of them, et cetera. And, of, you know, in the past, they were majority Cisco because um, obviously Cisco endpoints don't natively support Skype or, or Teams. Uh, now with Teams, we're starting to see that shift 
and we're seeing polycom endpoints also joining. So actually that the, the mix is changing with teams because there's not a great deal of, of well, in fact, there's no non-native endpoints that, that work with teams. Uh, so that mix is definitely changing. Mm, that's interesting. Um, and so maybe maybe just chat a little bit about how um, your product differentiates in the market, you know, compared to others. Like, what, what's a real differentiator in your opinion? Um, I think for us, the biggest differentiator is that um, certainly when it comes to teams, we we actually went back and decided to design from scratch an entirely new gateway um, that was built for Azure and for Teams. So everything we have as a part of our Real Connect for Teams product is entirely new. Um, we built it to run on uh, Windows uh, virtual machines in Azure, and they actually it actually runs on the same um, uh, the same uh, computer that's running the Microsoft SDK as well. So we wanted to reduce latency, keep everything in one place. So when each gateway call is um, is, is is stood up, all of the encoding and decoding and the signaling. Um, translation is all done on a single Windows VM, including the composition and layouts that are created on that same VM as well. So we reduce the latency between um, those different working components. Um, and obviously, because the Teams MCU is in Azure as well, that, uh, there's also a reduced um, uh, network piece there as well. So Polycom is all, all of the components are all in Azure together with you know, where Teams is, is located from a you know, connectivity standpoint. Um, the only other thing I would say is we don't differentiate between Skype for Business Online and Teams. So when you buy a Real Connect service license, you get access to Teams Interop and Skype for Business Online Interop with the same license. So that, that also is a, you know, a key point to take into account as well. Yeah, cer certainly. I guess so. For migration purposes, that will, you know, assist customers making that that journey. So certainly not going to be one that's going to happen overnight. We're we're definitely not seeing it happen quickly. Yeah. <laughs> hey, speaking of journeys, Adam, uh, out there in the real world, uh, what are some of the most successful scenarios you see with the the VTC interop solution, Real Connect? where a scenario is what combination of like video room systems, uh, platforms and connected devices typically work the, the best is like the best suited for this solution? Um, so we don't really care too much about the VTC type because in most cases, if it's a VTC, it's going to dial in with SIP or H323, and it's going to use uh, H264, uh, AVC, and it's going to get a pretty similar experience. Um, and so, you know, mixing those together with native Microsoft endpoints like, you know, Skype Room System, um, you know, it, it's they, you know, they they can be mixed and matched. So, I mean, quite often a customer will say, "Well, I'm looking at, you know." you know, endpoints in my organization, you know, I don't know, I've got, you know, some people that are doing Zoom, I've got other people that are only using Teams, um, what do I do? And, and the answer is, is there isn't a one size fits all in many cases. So you can mix and match, you can have a Skype room system in one room and, a, you know, a, a Cisco in another room or a Polycom in the other. So um, they all play well together. Um, the only other thing I would mention is, um, the one thing which seems to be, um, you know, the uh, the icing on the cake is uh, ensuring the one touch dial capabilities deployed. So we we have this, uh, we call it a one touch dial service um, where Cisco and Polycom endpoints can talk to that solution. And uh, ultimately, it gives the admins the ability to uh, connect their mailboxes that are being used to the endpoints so that users can come in the room and just click a button and join the meeting. Um, that seems to be absolutely vital because anything more than a single click 
typically means the endpoint doesn't get used or the meeting breaks down, it doesn't happen properly. People don't like using these these things. I have one here. I, I don't like using it, but I have to every now and then. Um, and so that's 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 life. Uh, so that that's definitely another piece that's important. Cool. Yeah, that single click seems to be like paramount for user adoption. Yeah. Oh yeah. Any uh, any particular uh, scenarios or, or circumstances that come to mind that's like particularly challenging, both in in the environment or or a particular room-based system that's already in place in, in the enterprise? Yes, there are definitely some things or some prerequisites that need to be in place um, because because this has been built for multiple ecosystems and different types of, uh, of video platforms. Um, not every um, you know, video uh, firewall traversal product operates in the same way. And because all of the calls are essentially um, you know, B2B calls, you know, people are dialing out to a service that's hosted externally, they have to make sure that their, their dialing out abilities are, are working right. Um, and it's surprising how many people have locked down, you know, who they can dial externally and how they can dial externally. And um, definitely one of the things is, is making sure, A, you have a su supported um, firewall traversal mechanism for video. Um, you know, we support things like uh, Cisco VCS uh, E and uh, Polycom's um, uh, our pad product, so we have our own firewall traversal product for video. Um, and if you're using a regular firewall, then again, that needs to be configured correctly as well. Um, so those those are some of the areas where things can break down. Um, and uh, you know, in many environments, you can get this thing up and running in like you know 30 minutes if you know what you're doing and things are configured right. But there are many cases where it doesn't happen that way, and you know. Our services teams go in, or we have some support calls, etc. Cool. Yeah, Adam. So I've been through the the certification route on direct routing uh, for Teams, and and I was done via third party TechVision. Uh, you've kind of maybe helped write the standard for cloud in, uh, video interrupts. So how did that certification process work for you, and then how has that kind of maybe changed for other vendors to come into the program? Um. It's interesting, certification is very different depending on the different products. Um, on, for example, 3PIP with phones, um, that was a very um, structured program that Microsoft has. And, you know, there's a lot of test cases, it's very detailed. And because of Link Phone Edition, they knew exactly what they wanted. And essentially, they wanted our phones to replicate that. With the video interop, I would say it was a lot more uh, collaborative. You know, we helped design the test cases more. Um, you know, we because we built out how video interrupt should behave, it was really a case of just saying, okay, this is how things work. Let's make sure that this is how things do work once we've built this new product. Um, and then the other thing which was paramount um, to certification uh, for all the vendors was ensuring that customers had used the service in a tap and, 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 and enough hours of meetings and video calling were reached to ensure that you know, the success criteria was met. So you know, we and, and the other vendors had um, a number of hours that we had to reach for video meetings in tap. Um, and so you know, that in itself, was tricky because at the point where we did certification, there weren't many people using Teams for video, let alone looking to bring a VTC into Teams meetings. So, um, you know, we, we had to work a lot with customers um, and uh, get them to have those meetings and use the service as well. Yeah. So, so maybe you can uh, talk about like the components around, say someone has a, te a Cisco telepresence room uh, and they want to bring that room with voice video uh, and content into either a, a Teams meeting or a Skype for Business meeting. Uh, you talked about that the Teams interop is kind of its own entity, but you get licensed for both. So what would that look like, that architecture? 
Um, so we, we did with, with immersive rooms or, or telepresence, um, we, we did some interesting stuff with Skype for Business, um, whereby the, um, as you know, the immersive rooms can, can in many cases have two or more cameras. And what happens with, uh, with standards-based bridges is they take the video feeds and they essentially create this stitched composition of the entire room. And they know, you know, this camera's on the left, this camera's on the right, this camera's on the middle, and we, we kind of manage that. Um, and so we, we actually built something that allowed Skype users to get the same experience, and we send it out through the, uh, the panoramic video that's supported by Skype for Business. Um, with Teams, we don't, because there's no panoramic video yet, we, we haven't built out that functionality. Um, we are working with Microsoft on that. So um, instead, what happens with Teams right now is you would, you would get the, either the center camera or um, the camera would switch depending on where the active audio is coming from. Uh, Cisco rooms typically, um, they will switch. Uh, polycom rooms, they'll, they'll um, invariably send the center camera in all cases. But we, we do obviously want to use the panoramic video at some point. Mm. Awesome. So um, anybody have any other questions for, for Adam? Or Actually, one, one last question, Adam. I, I should probably know the answer to this, but just at a high level, <clears throat> how is Real Connect priced? Like, is it per user or how's that yeah. work? Yeah, so there's a there's so I'm I'm not a sales guy, but I can I can give you some uh, some of you. so interestingly enough, this was one of the lessons learned that we had when we when we launched the um, the first service. Microsoft and Polycom had this view that we should just license this like PSDN conferencing. So, for example, if I want um, the ability to do video interop, I should just turn that on in the control panel um and you know have a license for each user that i want to assign it to um that funnily enough um did not work well it, it was it, it's funny people in the video world they they think about ports or, or yeah. vtc concurrency so um what we we decided to move to um was this concurrency based license instead so um if let's say you have i don't know 10 VTCs throughout your organization, but you work out, well, I'm probably only going to use up to five of them at any one time, then that would be five ports in your organization. Um, and so we now have that same concurrency model uh, in the service. And if you have five licenses, then the concurrency of those can be used across either Skype for Business Online or Teams. So if you have two people in Teams, and then three people on Skype for Business Online, and that's your five. Right. Good. Thanks, Adam. Sure. Just just one question on the two interop systems. Does that mean the, the meeting invite will have two different VTC joins, or is it one join that can be either Skype for Business Online or Teams, depending on the organizer? Oh, yeah, it, it basically, so in my outlook that I've got here, if I schedule a Teams meeting, I get the coordinates for the service in, uh, in Azure um, that we've got for Teams. And then if I create a Skype for Business meeting, I get different coordinates, in a different domain, which points to the other service that we're running also in Azure. But they're, they're completely separate services. And uh, actually, the older service um, for SFBO is, uh, is far more uh, aligned with some of our on-prem products. So, you know, these acronyms like RMX and DMA and all these components you might have heard of, there some versions of those, not quite the same, but similar versions of those are used in the SFBO service. So you hit a different uh, set of infrastructure, if that makes sense. Perfect. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks, Adam, for for coming on and uh, sharing uh, all this information about uh, about your solution, and uh, we really appreciate it. So. Um, again, thanks for coming out and uh, oh. uh, thanks everybody for listening in and hopefully we'll catch you on the next episode. Thanks cool. for having me. Thanks, See guys. You.